welcome back everyone happy uh happy new year happy lunar new year um today is uh, the first talk of the new year uh our speaker is uh, from prague uh, jan halatsky telling us so he's inviting us to to study graphon so let uh, welcome uh, yes. so i i want to talk about some basic concepts uh, in graphons, uh, and you you probably you probably know graphons are uh, graphons are a, a, an, a, an essential extension of uh, finite graphs uh, with uh, some measure theoretic and limit aspects. Uh, so what I want to do at the beginning is uh, to uh, introduce these basic, really basic uh, concepts that actually were introduced by Lovas and his co-authors uh, some 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and then from there, what I want to do is to look at things we take uh, as uh, really basic for graphs. So things, concepts like independent sets or matchings these are things you know any course in discrete mathematics or graph theory starts with and somehow these concepts were not really uh, at the when the theory of graphons was introduced around 2014 by lovas they didn't seem to play such an important role yet the claim i want to make here is that they actually do have uh, some uh, you know, th there are reasonable definitions of those in the world of graph uh, graphons, and uh, there is a, a nice theory about that. Okay, so that's that's the plan for today. Okay, so as as I said, graphons are a, a, an extension of finite graphs introduced by Lovas and his co-authors. The first paper came out in, or maybe appeared as a preprint, I don't remember, in 2004. And they have been used to, you know, to create a, a, a fascinating theory per se, but also... Uh, <laughs> also they also they led to solving many problems uh, in the extremal graph theory and in the theory of random graphs i will certainly not get to uh, explaining the importance of graphons to the letter uh, but in both these theories they solved some uh, some long standing problems so again in my opinion it's a beautiful theory in itself but even if you don't like measure theory even if you don't like analysis uh, and you have this uh, uh, problem solving approach and you want to attack uh, problems, old problems about finite graphs, then graphons may be actually a good tool. Okay, so the main idea is to introduce uh, some uh, analytic objects. Uh, in they turn, they turn out to be symmetric measurable functions. Uh, defi defined on the unit square. So that's uh, that's here we, and taking values in the interval zero, one. And, uh, and always with graphons and with other limit theories, it's not only about introducing some objects, but you, you want to introduce them because you want to create a limit theory. In other words, you need to have some convergence concept, which tells you you need to come up with uh, with the notion of a distance, okay? And the way you want to do it with graphons and with uh, other uh, theories of uh, limits of discrete objects. So by now, you know there is a theory of limits of permutations that the limit objects are called permutons. There is a theory of uh, limits of functions on abelian groups. There is a theory of limits on uh, Latin squares. There are many, many uh, limit concepts, but what you want is you want to have a, a, a distance notion, which, which gives you a compact space. Okay. 
and I will I will explain why this compactness is so crucial. So, so before uh, you can see, I, I wrote uh, wrote up a, a formula for some metric, and I will explain that in a minute. But first, let me uh, as an exercise uh, uh, explain how if you have how graphons with this definition, so functions symmetric functions defined on the unit square taking values in zero one how they extend finite graphs okay well and they do extend it in that sense that if you have a finite graph let me take this example so such a finite graph can be represented as an adjacency matrix Right, so where the number of rows and the number of columns is equal to the number of vertices, and um, and you put a, a zero, a one if a, the corresponding pair forms an edge and a zero otherwise. For example, when there are no self loops, then automatically you have zeros on the diagonal, and then I think for this particular graph, the adjacency matrix looks like this. Okay, so that's just an adjacency matrix representation of, of the graph. And then the next step is you say, well, okay, so let's not think of this adjacency matrix as, a, uh, as an a, N three by three array in this case, but let's just squeeze it uh, into the unit square. Okay, so you just make this the zero, zero corner you make the, the bottom right corner, the, the one one corner, and suddenly it became a measurable function on the unit square, okay? And again, uh, notationally, it's convenient to orient the Euclidean, uh, Euclidean space a bit differently than, uh, than is, is usual. So that's you know the same with, uh, say, young tableau you have these two possible notations, you have, I think, what's called the English notation and the French notation. So here uh, also, um, this, this will be uh, my uh, orientation of the Euclidean plane for the purpose of this talk, which is made uh, in a way which is compatible with how uh, matrices are written down. Okay, so this is what you can do with any graph. You can write down its adjacency matrix and you can squeeze it uh, into the un into a unit square, and obviously the fact uh, you get a measurable function, the fact that the adjacency matrix of an undirected graph is symmetric translates to the fact that your uh, your function is symmetric. So w x y equals w y x. That's that's what I mean when I say symmetric. And um, uh, and note that. So far, I have only used values zero and one in the range. I haven't used any values between, which is okay. The, the values between zero and one will, on, will not emerge from representations of finite graphs, but only when we come to some graph sequences. So they will only emerge in limits. Okay. And, and the, the, so, so the, now the notion of metric, what I wrote down here, you have two graphons U and W, and there is this, note, there is this thing called cut norm distance, which is you take the maximum over, well, it should be supremum, but um, uh, over all rectangles S and T, and you compare the integral uh, of u and the integral of w on uh, the rectangle s cross t. Okay. Now, this is not really the the notion that leads to compact uh, compact setting. There is a there is a one more step that needs to be uh, done if you really want to uh, develop your theory fully. But actually, for the purpose of the talk, we can pretend. Uh, that this is the definition of uh, our compact topology. Okay. So please stop me if there are any questions.
Um, this is sort of the, 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 the graph on basics. Okay, so, so, so what is now the, the philosophy of this theory? We introduced uh, this set, this space of analytic objects called graphons. We uh, managed to embed every finite graph uh, into that space. And um, we did that in a compact way. Okay, so in other words, if I have a sequence of finite graphs, then there exists a subsequence and a limit graph on, let's say with, you know, with the metric uh, introduced on the, on the last slide. Again, it's not quite uh, precise uh, to that sequence. Okay. And further, it turns out that many important graph parameters for which you can come up with um, their graph on counterparts are continuous, right? So why do people, you know, why do people uh, do topology at all? Or uh, well, because they want to study continuity properties of functions, right? So continuity of functions somehow is a, is a concept which basically forces you to think about, uh, about topology of spaces. Okay, so okay, so we have these two uh, facts about the theory of graphons. How do you use them if you want to prove uh, if you want to prove statements about finite graphs? Well, let's let's for example let's uh, come up with such a scheme for this uh, toy version of what could be Mantel's or Turan theorem. The statement would be that if I have, there are at most finitely many counterexamples to a fact that if a graph has, among all the pairs in a graph, uh, more than 51% of them form an edge, then there is no triangle, right? So again, you know, this is a, this is a very easy theorem to prove, in fact, we know that there are zero counterexamples to that fact, uh, but and we know that fifty-one is not sharp. Fifty is the right threshold. But let's uh, let's try uh, to prove uh, this uh, simple statement. Statement. Okay. Well, the way you would do it is the following. Suppose the statement doesn't hold. Suppose this toy, toy theorem doesn't hold. Hence, there are infinitely many graphs where the proportion of edges among all pairs is more than 51%, and none of them contains a triangle, then you would use this idea one. So among these infinitely many, there is an infinite subsequence and a limit graph on to that. Okay, And then you would use this idea two, which tells you that many important parameters are continuous. The, in particular, what is really in the heart of the theory is, is that the parameters about the density of triangles and that of the edge density are continuous. So now what I know about the limit object I created at this moment is that it must have edge density, whatever it means. We don't know what an edge density of a graphon is at this moment, but the edge, there is a notion of an edge density of a graph one. And for the graph one, which, which appears as a limit of our counterexamples, this edge density is more than 0.51, or at least 0.51. And its triangle density, again, whatever it means, is zero. Okay, so that's from the assumed existence of infinitely many our counterexamples, we created this limit object with no triangles and uh, density of edges at least 0.51. And then in this world of graphons, you do have tools to show that such an object uh, cannot exist. So somehow in some settings, you have additional analytic tools which either do not exist for finite graphs or are much more difficult to formulate. And you can make use of these tools in this analytic uh, setting. Okay. 
So the, and this is indeed a scheme with you know which uh, has been used uh, quite successfully to uh, to uh, prove uh, many things. Okay. So now I have talked about densities, and this is of of things of say smallish graphs like edges, edge density, or triangles. And that's indeed one of the first parameters which uh, was uh, supplied by Lovas and his co-authors as a continuous parameter, right? So if in a finite graph, what would be the density of triangles? Well, you take all possible triples of vertices and you ask what is the proportion of the, those that form a triangle, right? That would be the density of a triangle in a finite graph. If, if you ask uh, an algebraist to, uh, to tell you what the density of triangles in a finite graph is, then the answer they would tell you is probably the following. Take the range with three ind indices, let's call them I1, I2, I3, over all, uh, all rows, of the adjacency matrix of a graph. Okay. And now check that at positions I1, I2, uh, so ask for what proportion of these triples of you know, indices I1, I2, I3, you see at the same time in the adjacency matrix, a one at position I1, I2, I2, I3, and I3, I1. Right, because that that is indeed a tri that, that is indeed what it means to you know that I one I two and I three forms a, form a triangle. Right, there is a one at position I one comma I two, there is a one at position I two comma I three, and there is a one at position I three comma I one. Okay, and somehow this idea translates nicely into into the setting uh, setting of of graphons. Somehow, as a as a shortcut, whenever you know of uh, whenever you know of a graph theoretic uh, definition which involves summation of, of vertices, then you just you, and you want to write its graph on counterpart, then you start integrating instead. Okay, and uh, then you know there were these three things that at three positions at the same time I want to see a one. Uh, so that that just translates to you know I want to see a product in the uh, I want sorry I want to see a one in the product of these two entries and this is exactly what the definition is. So the 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 density that would be the common uh, common shortcut to abbreviate density of in this case a triangle in a graph on W is defined by this formula. Okay. So. That's uh, and again, you can come up if you understand if you internalize this definition, then you can write uh, easily definitions of other things than K3. You can write the, down the definition of a four cycle density or whatever else. Okay, so this this was this was a standard. This was a standard uh, definition of, uh, of of densities, which indeed was uh, is a continuous parameter. Okay. So now I would like to cover three, sort of two more concepts, uh, two more concepts uh, which are uh, very elementary for graphs. And I would like to talk about uh, how they extend to graphons. So the first concept is that of independent sets. So, we know what uh, an independent set in a graph is. You have a bunch of vertices uh, which induce uh, no edges. Okay. So actually, uh, how would an algebraist formulate what an independent set is? Well, you have a subset of uh, you have a subset of vertices. So that if you look at the adjacency matrix and you restrict the rows and the columns to that set, 
then you see just zeros in the adjacent matrix. That's what an independent set is. Okay. In much of graph theory studies, uh, the maximum independence uh, set, so among all independent set, the one of, um, or, uh, of maximum cardinality. And for me, it will be convenient to normalize this to get what's called independence ratio by the number of vertices. Okay, so I'm getting, I'm getting um, a parameter bit, which will be between zero and one. So, so far, this was very standard graph theoretic definitions. Let me maybe emphasize that um, quite often this last normalization in graph theory uh, is not useful. So, for example, when you study independent sets, maximum independent sets, or in random graphs of um, of a super constant uh, average degree, then the maximum independent set there will be smaller, right? So if you have uh, graphs of bounded maximum degree, then automatically maximum independent set must be of linear size. But as, uh, as soon as your degrees are more than constant, then it's not clear that the, the, the maximum independent set will be of linear size. Sometimes it may be, in which uh, case you are in a setting which I want to expand a little bit now. But in some applications, unfortunately, your question is like, is my maximum independent size maybe of, of size square root n or, uh, or log n? And in those cases, the quantity I, I defined here will tend to zero. So your lenses uh, will not be, uh, uh, these lenses will not be appropriate for, the, for uh, the problem you are studying, okay? So again, I'm admitting that this scaling is suitable only for some applications. Okay, so now, that's the same slide, except I edit on everywhere, right? So it's not about graphs, but gra graphons. So what's an independent set in a graphon? Well, it should be a subset of your ground space, right? Now your ground space are not vertices anymore. It's just a copy of the unit interval. Such that when you restrict, the graph on, on that set, you see zero and okay, the, the entire theory is up to null set. So zero everywhere. So let me just try the definition. So a measurable set is, uh, is, uh, in the, is an independent set. for a graph on W, if when you integrate W on A cross A, you see a zero, right? Which is equivalent because W is non-negative. This is equivalent to W restricted uh, to A cross A being zero almost everywhere, okay? And of course, like in uh, finite graph theory, you, you mostly care about sets of maximum cardinality, so that's a counting problem, then here there is no counting, we, but uh, there is a zero one has a Lebesgue measure, right? So which I will denote by, by lambda. So, so that defines you the, what an independent ratio of a graph on should be. You would be looking at all independent sets in the graph on, and you would be taking the, uh, the one of maximum cardinality. Uh, sorry, maximum Lebesgue measure, sorry. La maximum Lebesgue measure, okay? So there are two reasons. Now, there are two reasons why I wrote max. 
because actually if you think about it a little bit, then it's not that obvious, then the maximum is achieved, right? You just have, you know, uh, um, some wild uh, family of independent sets of different measures. And, you know, in analysis, most of the time, maximum, maxima are not attained. So, so one reason I wrote max is that indeed you can prove and it's not so difficult. And I will sort of get to the, into the main tool, which is weak star convergence. You can prove that there exists a set of maximum, independent set of maximum size or maximum measure. Okay, and the second second reason I typed it is somehow the this program I was using for, for making these slides for some funny reason doesn't allow me to type soup. But, uh, but at least I had the, the first reason as a justification. Okay. So just to give you, so, so this is the definition of an independence ratio, just to have one example. So if this is if this is my W, what would W be? Well, I would probably call this W a complete unbalanced bipartite graph, right? So there, there seems there seem to be two parts. Uh, which in themselves, so X is an independent set, Y is an independent set. Uh, between X and Y, there is a complete connection. And actually you can check that any independent set is either an, an, you, you know, a subset of X or as, is a subset of Y, right? So th this graph on should be, sh sh it's completely reasonable to call it complete unbalanced bipartite graph. And the independence ratio, well, on this picture, Y seems to be the bigger of the two. So the independence ratio would be maybe 0 0.7 or whatever proportion of the unit interval this y, y takes, okay? Okay, so that's, uh, and please ask questions uh, if, if, if that's, that's needed. Okay, so, so there is, uh, just one more definition and uh, which is the same as in finite graphs. Well, what, when do you call a, a finite graph, well, k-partite or k-colorable, that's the same definition, if you can decompose its vertices into k-independent sets. Right? So likewise, I call a graph on k-colorable if I can decompose the unit interval into K measurable sets, each of which is independent. So for example, the, the, the graph on W, which I drew as an example, uh, was a two colorable uh, graph on, because X was one of the sets and Y was uh, the other set in the decomposition. Okay, so again, I'm hoping this is a very simple definition. And then we will see what we can do uh, with these definitions. Okay, so I defined a concept of independent set for graph on and the quantity, which seems to be the, the, the first quantity, numerical quantity, when you want to talk about, uh, about uh, uh, independent sets. So somehow quantify their size. But if you have that and you claim that this is somehow useful uh, to the theory of graphons, then uh, you should claim some continuity properties. Because again, a concept in graphon theory is useless if there is no continuity, because that's all what, what graphons are about. So if I have, say, a sequence of finite graphs, and I, and for each of them, I calculate their independence ratio, then the question should be, does it converge to the independence ratio of the limiting graph on as I defined it on the last slide? Well, and the answer is unfortunately no. So why, why, let me give you an example. There is a very simple example to that. So let's say that GN is 
just a matching, let's say, on two n vertices. You could you could have you know thousands of other counterexamples. So you just take a, a matching on on two n vertices. The the independence ratio of such, such a graph is obviously half. You can't have an independent set that would would uh, be, you know, touch more or contain more than half of the vertices. Yet, what these things do converge to, so the graph on these finite graphs converge to, uh, okay, I will explain that in, in a minute, is the constant zero graph on. And that's a, that's a uh, property of, uh, you know, graph, the limits of dense graphs is that somehow the, the limit object is insensitive to subquadratic changes in the sequence. So if you have a sequence of graphs, and for example, uh, it contains, it, the, the graphs in the sequence contain subquadratically many edges relative to the number of vertices, then these things uh, converge to the constant zero graph on. Okay, so just if you, if you, uh, hear you know about graphons for the same uh, first time then let me maybe emphasize this again graph limits you know with the concept of graphons are a very useful theory when you want to work with uh, graph sequences where the number of edges is quadratic to the number of, of, of vertices there are, of course, many exciting problems in graph theory that involve trees or that involve planar graphs, uh, where the number of edgy, edges is, for example, linear, right? With, with uh, planar graphs or with trees, it's just linear with the number of vertices. And there, there are some other uh, limit theories, but this uh, limit theory of graphons will not help you because the trivial object you will get is the constant zero object. Okay, so anyway, let's get back to this example. We have a sequence of uh, graphs of each individual of independence ratio one half, and they converge to the constant zero graphon where obviously the independence ratio is just one. So that's an obvious counter. Uh, that's an obvious counter example to the desired property of continuity. Well, not all is lost because because actually the the independence ratio is not continuous, but it's uh, well. I will say it wrong. I'm getting uh, upper continuous. Okay. So the the example I I get gave you was a sequence in which the independence ratio of each individual in the sequence was small and it was big in the limit. You couldn't, you cannot cook up an example where it would be the other way around. Okay, so the claim is that if, so, so claim, uh, which I have a proof here for is, that uh, in the setting above, so if you have a sequence of graphs converging to a graphon, then the lim inf, uh, lim sup of the independence ratios is at most the independence ratio of the limit object. Okay. So, uh, so let me let me prove it here, and I will need a little bit of uh, analysis. So if you are, if uh, which I cannot ex explain fully. So you know, if you don't want to follow, then this will be just uh, three minutes. So how does one <laughs> prove such a thing? Well, so so what is the task? I have a sequence of graphs. I know that there are some independent sets in each of them and based on large independent sets or somewhat large independent sets in these graphs GN, I would like to cook up a large independent set in W, right? That's exactly what the claim asks us to do. Okay, so 
let me view this. Uh, let me view these graphs through this graphon representation as uh, as graphons. So all of a sudden they get embedded into the unit uh, square. And then let me highlight the the independent set. Right. So I can consider the indicator function of that independent set, which is now a function on zero one. So I, for each graph, I have an independent set. And then there is a compact compactness result uh, for functions on the unit interval called the banach aloglu theorem, which tells me that there is uh, a suitable limit to these uh, indicator functions. Uh, it's called a weak star limit. I, uh, okay. And now let that uh, weak star limit be, let me call it G. That's a function, it, the elementary properties of, of weak star limit tell, tell you that it's a function where the, the integral of which is the limit of, uh, of the integrals of independent, of independent functions of these individual graphs. Uh, that function is, is between zero and one. And then you have to do a little bit of work, but it's not much to see that actually the, the support of that function. So those points of the function of the, you know, the, that subset where G is strictly positive is an independent set in the graph on W. Okay. So what I have is that I can I have a function. I have, sorry, I have a set which for sure is an independent set of for W. That's the function. That's the set which is the support of G. And these two properties combined tell me that uh, the uh, the measure of the support is at least the limit of the independence ratios, right? Because the the integral of G is the limit of the independence ratio. And this integral, the, the, the function that is being integrated is, 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 is at most one, right? So you can't integrate too much on just a very small space. If the function is bounded, then, the, then its support must be pretty big, must be at, at least the, the, limit, the, the limit of the independence ratios, okay? So we will see a variant for this uh, in another uh, uh, in another result. Okay, so here I want to use this concept of independent sets to say something in, uh, interesting about forbidden subgraphs. And I can't think of uh, any theorem uh, from finite graphs which would go in the direction of the two theorems I have on this on this slide. Maybe the one that gets somehow closest is the theorem, which I think I was taught really in my first uh, lesson of uh, discrete mathematics, which was that a graph is bipartite if and only if it does not contain um, any, any odd cycle, right? So you have this global statement that the whole graph can be, you know, decomposed into two independent sets. And then you have these local tests, like test for the triangle and test for C5 and so on. Okay. So let me try to read these two theorems. The first one is the following. So suppose I have a finite graph, maybe a triangle, maybe a four cycle, whatever, uh, and a graph on. And with the definition of the density, which at least in one particular instance I gave you on a previous slide, uh, W does not contain copies of H. Okay. So maybe, you know, maybe W doesn't contain a triangle, let's say. Well, you know, the first thing you would like to say is, well, then the, the host graph is bipartite and you know it's not quite true, right? You know that avoiding a triangle is not quite the same as being uh, uh, bipartite. You can't actually, I don't think you can make any useful statement about graphs avoiding a triangle, some characterization or something in finite world. But actually here you can do. 
you, w is countably partite. Okay, so you can decompose, which is you can decompose the ground space, you can decompose zero one into countably many parts where each part, so i k cross i k induces, uh, you know, a constant zero uh, subpart of the graph one. Okay. And this has uh, sort of a five line proof if you know some really non trivial analysis. So it's called the exhaustion principle. If you do things right, then the exhaustion principle gives you that. Okay, so here is another, another theorem, which I would like to uh, do in a bit more detail. So suppose you have a graph on W and then the following are equivalent. W is K colorable and W has zero densities of all graphs of chromatic number more than K. Okay. So, and what I would like to do now, I would like to, to talk a little bit more about that theorem and show you uh, to hint uh, a proof. Okay, so again, this is the, the, the theorem we have. We have a natural number K, we have a graph on W, and what I want, what I want to do is this implication that if all graphs of chromatic number more than K are absent from W, then W is K colorable. There's just one implication out of two. Let me just say that the other implication is, uh, is really easy. It's just, uh, it's, it's routine. It's just writing down the definition of, uh, of this uh, density, right? There is some, uh, some integral formula uh, involved and you can get it automatically from there, okay? And again, I will be using the same trick as before, the, the weak star convergence, um, but it should be, so if for some reason you don't like weak, weak star convergence, then you don't have to listen. It will be two, two minutes, okay? So, here is what you do. You, you generate a sequence of finite graphs. From the graph on. There is a standard procedure of generating what's sometimes called an inhomogeneous random graph based on the, the graph on. The, uh, and it's a very nice procedure which generalizes uh, uh, this uh, erdes rényi model GNP. Okay, I will not talk too much about it, but the, the two properties I will say is first from the fact that uh, no, uh, no chromatic, so there is density zero of all uh, graphs of chromatic number k, more than k, you can deduce that with probability one, so almost surely, this randomly generated graph is k colorable as well. Okay, that really follows from the definition of the density. This density really captures what is happening in this random generation. And second, it is known that these random graphs, uh, these, random, these randomly generated graphs almost surely converge in the cut norm in this uh, key metric, they converge to the graph on W, okay? So how do we how do we use these two facts? Well, we use the first fact in the you know in the very definition of what the chromatic number means. So we know that we can partition the vertex set of G n into k sets. Okay, and also we know that if we want, we can embed. Uh, Gn as a uh, represent it as a graph on. So these these are now under this representation no more uh, k sets of vertices, but rather it's a decomposition of the unit interval. Okay. And now, so we did that for each n. So what we have is we have a sequence of graphs 
each, uh, well, sequence of graphons, sorry, each of which comes with its own partition of, uh, of the unit interval into K independent sets. Right? So it's not graphs, it's graphons now, and it's not a decomposition of the vertex set, but rather it's a decomposition of the unit interval. And now you again invoke this machinery of the banach aloglu theorem. And you say, well, if I had, you know, if I had a sequence of k tuples of indicator functions, then there is a, a limit. And that limit is, uh, is a k tuple of functions, which in some sense decompose the constant one function. Right? Like, uh, okay. So, and now their support is is a witness the, these functions are not you know they are between zero and one they sum up to constant one function hence the union of their supports must cover the entire uh, the entire interval and you as before you can prove that the support of each of these functions is an independent set for w okay so that was uh, that was very briefly, and uh, I understand that, uh, that there may be some details, which but the the whole proof is really five or ten lines, if if you look it, at it the, the, the right way. Okay. So, Hong, when should I stop? Should I stop now? Uh, usually we run it for an hour. So uh, one hour for the whole. Okay, okay. I'm happy to talk more then. Okay. So this is uh, this was what I wanted to tell you about independent sets. So let me take another concept which I think is quite uh, quite uh, essential in graph theory, and that is of of matchings. Okay. So maybe a little bit uh, of. Um, of the work on, on matchings, uh, overview of on works on, on matchings in the context of graphons, and then I will get to two definitions. So I have a paper with Ping Hu and Diana Piguet where we uh, introduce something which we called F tilings in, okay, in finite graphs. So that's uh, something which is well studied, and that would be so, so in this notation. I, I guess styling uh, can mean uh, many different things, but that means this means uh, these vertex disjoint copies of of a graph f, right? And when you take f equals k two, then these f tilings become matchings. So the the first paper that was out there was this general theory of f tilings uh, transferred to the setting of graphons, and actually. Uh, there was an application. There is a paper entitled Komoshi Styling Theorem via Graphon Covers. So, you know, that was an application where if you don't care about graphons at all, you just want to, you know, prove results in extreme graph theory. We use this, uh, uh, this really to, to reprove, I think in a, well, maybe not, not necessarily more elegant, but in a more streamlined way, uh, a theorem of, of Comloche, which which tells you under what minimum uh, degree conditions I can guarantee uh, an f tiling of a, of a certain uh, size. Okay, so uh, so let me just recall. Uh, okay, and I don't have that much time, so I think I will uh -huh, I will uh, cover this very briefly, but in graphs you have these two standard concepts for match regarding you know the uh, vertex disjoint copies of of k2 and they are called matchings and a fractional matching right so so i think everyone knows what a matching is and what a fractional matching is you have a graph And then, so in a matching, you would select 
you would select uh, some edges and you would select them in a way where they don't uh, overlap on vertices. Now, instead of selecting edges, I'm allowed to put on any edge a non-negative weight. In such a way, in such a way that uh, at no vertex, the so total sum of weight would, weights would be more than one. Okay. And you can check that if all the weights are required to be restricted to be either zero or one, then actually this is just another way of encoding a, a proper a proper matchings. Right. So what you care about matchings most of the time is the size of the maximum matching. And you normalize that. So let me call it again, ma maximum ratio. And so that would be the size of the, the number of edges in a maximum matching normalized again by the number of vertices. And for the maximum, sorry, ma what I meant was matching ratio, sorry. And for the fractional matching ratio, you would be the, you would do the same thing. So you would have a normalization by the number of, of uh, vertices of your graph, but, but the, what you, you would have in the nominator instead would be, you have your, your, function your matching which is a fractional matching which is just a function on the edges and you would take its well l1 norm okay so in in either case in the matching ratio and fractional matching ratio you are getting a quantity between zero and one that's you know what you want to do in general when you want to pass to a limit where there is no n anymore there is no number of vertices Everything should be just a, a, a ratio. Okay. And uh, so now, you know, this is, I so far gave you only definitions, well, well known definitions for finite graphs. So let's uh, again ask this continuity question. Can I hope that I can come up with um, a notion of a matching ratio or a fractional matching ratio for a graph on again in a way? where you would have continuity, right? And the answer is, again, well, you cannot hope for full continuity. And the counterexample is exactly the same. If, your gra if the, you have a sequence of graphs, which are just a matching, uh, their matching ratio with that definition is one half, which is you know, the most it can be. In, in that sense, it's the, the, the richest, uh, uh, graph and yet these graphs converge to the constant zero graph on because the number of edges is uh, is subquadratic and whatever my definition of a matching number matching ratio in a graph on will be it better be zero for uh, uh, for constant zero graph on. okay yet and I will I, I think I will stop here yet, you can come up with a definition of a, of, a, of a matching ratio, let's say, for graphons, which gives you lower semi-continuity. So, so the opposite. So here, you know, I had a sequence of things with high uh, matching ratio converging to something where obviously the matching ratio was zero. But I can so so what what the the theorem says is you can't have the the opposite. So there is a definition of of matching ratio for graphons where you do have uh, this this low, lower semi semi continuity as is as is expressed by this formula. Now, let me just say uh, sort of with a, a lot of uh, shortcuts. Uh, how that theory looks. 
And there are maybe two things to, uh, to, to realize. Uh, one is that in the world of graphons, there is no, there is no difference between matchings and fractional matchings or matching ratio and fractional matching ratio. Okay, so if you have finite graphs, so for example, this finite graph, then the, the, the maximum matching in this graph is just one. There is only one edge you can take. But if you, if you ask for matching ratio, I, uh, fractional matchings, I can, for example, take such a function. It satisfies my axioms of a fractional matching and the total weight of that function is 1.5. So I could do you know, substantially better. So the reason why for graphons there should not be any difference is because of the regularity lemma. And so now I'm probably not talking to all of you, but uh, so if you have a sequence of graphs converging to a graphon, it makes no difference whether you have a sequence of graphs or a sequence of regularizations of those graphs, you know, they, that will converge to the same graph one. And then there is uh, this idea, which uh, I think was uh, the more, most explicitly expressed in a paper, I think of Alon and Euster, but the, the, it, uh, maybe in the late nineties, but it has been used many times since, is that if you have some fractional object in the cluster graph, you can conver converge it to an integral object, well, maybe in the graph itself, okay? And that sort of, that justifies the whole, the whole thing. So in graph forms, there is no difference. And this, the, the second thing, you know, when you are thinking how that theory should look, the, the second thing I would like to emphasize is, well, somehow matching in a graph form seems something, you know, in, that should be something incredibly thin, right? You have, you know, graph on the whole square. What it represents is this, you know, n choose too many pairs and matching is just something with, you know, n, n edges selected. So something very thin. So maybe you don't have fine enough analytic tools. So that doesn't, but now you say, okay, I, I do have this LP duality, which tells me that the size of the maximum fractional matching is the size of the minimum vertex cover, a fractional vertex cover. Uh, okay. And if you write down the definition of what a minimum uh, or what a vertex cover is, then that's a definition which is completely, completely translate, translatable to the world of graphons. You know, there, are, there is some summation, summation becomes integration. Uh, there are some uh, conditions for vertices. These become conditions for elements of your ground space and so on, okay? And this minimization problem then becomes a problem of finding an infinity, okay? So, so this, is, this is how you define the notion of what a fr fractional, matching number of a graphon is or fractional ratio of a graphon is, you go, you, you uh, employ this LP duality business, which you can do even in this analytic world and the whole theory goes through. Okay, so let me stop here. Mm -hmm. Let's first thank uh, Jan for the talk. So any questions?